Have you ever gone down a YouTube rabbit hole? You know this phenomenon. This is when you, let's say, open up a video on YouTube and for some reason, usually it's something that you didn't even know you were interested in, but for some reason, you look up and it's 3 a.m. and you've spent six hours watching video after video after video on this topic. What's happened? Well, what's happened is the YouTube algorithm, what you're experiencing is the YouTube algorithm getting a lock on your attention, figuring out exactly what it is that you want to see next and providing that to you. That's a pretty advanced idea. And as we said in the last video, it's even evidence that this algorithm knows your desires better than you do. Because usually when this rabbit hole happens, it's some completely new idea or concept, at least as far as you can tell. And yet the algorithm knows that it's going to grab your attention. So what we're going to talk about in this video is the algorithm. There's three big concepts that you need to understand. As we said, I'm going to show you the bars on the cage. I'm going to show you the plantation of the new version of a new type of slavery, really, in the attention economy, because it's all about you as a product and your attention specifically as the product. So the three big concepts that you need to understand or that you need to start to realize is the algorithm, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, or AI. The first two, the algorithm and machine learning, are a deep part of the system already. AI is what snaps the cage shut. We'll talk about that. That's towards the end. But let's first talk about where we are now, the algorithm and how we get to this point, how we get to a point where your engagement, your engagement is the key concern. Engagement meaning your attention being locked in to where the algorithm wants your attention. How does this come to be? Well, it starts from the business model that we discussed, the advertising-based business model. Because fundamentally, at the core of it is, your attention needs to be on the thing on which the advertisement will ride, shall we say. So let's take it back a ways. Let's take it back a ways to the earliest days of how this is done and the paradigm that's there. The paradigm is, well, I'm a publisher. So this starts out with things like newspapers and other types of periodicals, and it moves to radio, and it moves to television. And in that paradigm, the idea is there is some group of people that is consuming this content, whether it's a newspaper that's being read on a, a morning commute, whether it is a radio station or radio show that's being listened to, whether it's a television show that's being listened, that's being watched in prime time. There's some group of people, and this became known as a demographic. And the publishers, in order to sell advertisements, needed to learn about their demographic. And so all of these Companies and methods were developed to measure who's watching, who's checking this out. And they would come out with demographics that would be something like age range, sex, you know, how many male and how many female, uh, income level, education level. And so me, let's say I'm a radio station owner, a radio station, and I want to sell ads. I'm going to look at my demographic and I'm going to say, okay, it's a primarily 18 to 34 uh, college-educated women. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to find brands that are specifically trying to target them, and I'm going to try to sell ad space to those brands. So the idea is, who is watching this content? Or who is consuming this content? So we could say something like, who is watching this TV show? In a sort of broad sense, and then I'm going to sell the ads to a company that wants to reach my demographic. Okay, this is how the early days of the internet started as well. This first paradigm was already there, so web publishers, many of whom were already media companies, newspapers, radio stations, right, television stations, they still have big web presences. They did the same sort of thing, and they just did an additional sell. 
And then you had independent website operators who were like, okay, well, I've got some traffic. Maybe I've got hundreds of thousands or millions of people checking this out. Let me try to do the same thing with my demographics. But as I said, Google flipped that paradigm. They started an entirely new paradigm when it came to ads and how it began was they knew they were a search engine. And so what they started to sell was they started to sell promoted search results, which they still sell. And I remember when this first launched, it was called AdWords. I remember when this first launched because Google was trying to explain it to the public and trying to explain it to people who would buy these ads. So what they also developed was your ability as just a regular person to be able to buy some of these promoted search results. And the example that they, that Google used themselves in trying to explain this in, in a blog post and a, a sort of about was bicycle shops. And they said, well, anybody searching for bicycle shops, you could purchase in an auction and say, I want to pay this amount. And if that was the highest amount being uh, that was available at the time somebody searched bicycle shop, then you would get that placement and somebody could click through onto your search result. So you would get it above all the search results. And then you could do things like geo-target it. So I could say, well, but my bicycle shop is in St. Louis. So only people whose IP addresses are showing them in St. Louis, that's where we need to. That's They'll only show it to them. Facebook came along and they even had it deeper. So what you can start to see is that what they're doing is they're moving the paradigm. It's not about who's watching the show and let me advertise to the demographic in a shotgun approach. It's literally who's watching the TV. Who cares what the show is on the TV? I don't want to know about the show and the demographic that watches the show. I only want to know who's sitting in that living room because I'll just show them whatever ads they want to see no matter what show they're watching. So you could see where Facebook really blew this up because Google had information about what you were searching. They had information about what you were writing in your emails. That's Gmail. It's reading that. They start to have information about what you're watching. That's YouTube because Google owns YouTube. Facebook came along and they had even more, didn't they? Because you gave it to them and they knew who your friends were and they knew what things you were looking at and they started to put pixels in other websites so that they could track everywhere that you went and started to develop a profile of you. Now, what you need to understand is that they don't care about, like, it's you. It's not like NSA and they're spying on you. All they care about is who your profile is. And this algorithm, the algorithm that has now spread, the function is figure out who this individual is. Then with machine learning, make yourself even better at figuring that out as you train each other. So you train the machine and the mach machine trains you and it trains itself and it trains the other algorithms. And then show them what they want to see, both in terms of the things that they want to buy and in terms of the things that will keep them engaged. And this is what we're living in. Now, at the moment, what it has to show you is being provided by other human beings. So it's got this broad thing and it says, well, what best matches what this person wants to see next? When you get into a rabbit hole, that means that, yeah, it's got good stuff to show you. And that's often why it's brand new content to you because it's got a whole world to show you that'll be brand new and novelty attracts your attention and keeps your attention. That's why a rabbit hole is often about brand new information to you. Right? After that, you can't get in that same rabbit hole, and it's going to search for another one for you. But this is what's important to understand. So what we're going to talk about next, the next important thing is, what is our relationship as the people who are creating the content that the algorithm is then using to give to you? And the people who are the most adept at doing that, we call them influencers. So what is our relationship to the algorithm and the algorithm's relationship to us because we have become a symbiotic unit now. We're not separated, we're a type of a cyborg. So that's what's coming next. We're gonna talk about influencers and the human element of all of this. If you haven't watched the other videos, go back because these all build on themselves. All right, couple days and then we'll get into the human element. So I will see you then.